Hi, fellow believers in Christ. I just wanted to talk today about um, a topic that's been coming up a little bit in some of the YouTube videos that I've been watching. Um, I've been watching a couple of male teachers who I really like a lot, and I can tell that they love the Lord, and they've spent a lot of time studying the Word of God. Um, but they believe with all their hearts that women can never, under any circumstances, lead, preach, or teach. Um, now, I'm not hardcore on the other side, but as you know, obviously, I preach and teach on YouTube. So you, you, it's pretty obvious that I think women can do it under certain circumstances or whatever. So I'll go over that today. And because um, I think there's a lot of sincere people who really love the Lord, but they just have a misconception about what women's roles are. And um, it's because I believe the King James Bible, which is one of the greatest translations ever, um, and it's a beautiful highly accurate translation, but for some reason unknown to me, most of the verses regarding women in King James are not accurately translated, and I'll show you that later. Um, but for the most part, it's a great translation. Um, anyway, but it misleads a lot of people. And, and, um, but, but anyway, you'll, you'll, Bear with me because some of the stuff I say in this video, you might not agree with at first, but I think if you follow the video all the way to the end, you'll understand why I said it, okay? So first of all, what is a pastor? Well, the word pastor isn't really in the Bible, but the Bible does have the word shepherd, which is literally the same meaning, okay? A pastor and a shepherd are literally the same thing. But the way the Bible defines a, a shepherd is not the same way that the modern church does all the, exactly. The Bible simply defines a shepherd as somebody who is who leads the sheep um, in the in the right direction, or or at least should be leading them in the right direction. So that in, definitely includes discipleship, and it can also include teaching and preaching. Um, and using other gifts as well. Um, but it is somebody who ministers to the sheep, but he's supposed to lay his life down for the sheep. He's supposed to be giving and feeding the sheep, not the sheep feeding him, which is what you normally see in churches today is you see that the congregation actually feeds the pastor. <laughs> they give him his paycheck and he doesn't really do anything for the congregation a lot of times, uh, but, but he is feeding them the word of God. So if the pastor is at least feeding you the word of God, then he's doing a, a great service. He is ministering to you. Um, but if he's mainly just getting your, your money and you aren't getting the word of God out of him, um, it's the wrong relationship and he doesn't have a calling. Um, so, um, or else he's, you know, um, backslidden, one or the other. But I think a lot of pastors actually don't have a calling. They just are there because it's good money, <laughs> a stable work environment, and um, they were able to get in. Um, but anyway, um, but they're, they don't really understand that they're supposed to be giving the word out and giving themselves away sacrificially to the body rather than the other way around. So it's kind of funny how pastors will, will often mention John 10, 12, and they claim it's talking about the devil. But if you read it carefully, it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about false pastors. <laughs> it's saying that a false pastor, somebody who's leading the sheep without a calling, is a hireling, meaning they're doing it for money. And most pastors today are hirelings. They're doing it for money, whether male or female. Um, they don't have a calling from the Lord. They're in it because it's a good paying job. And it's got lots of stability and security and lots of nice perks. And that's why they're there. They're hirelings. They're not shepherds. Jesus is the good shepherd who feeds the sheep. The sheep don't feed Jesus. We don't feed Jesus. He feeds us. And so if you are a shepherd, which is a pastor, you should be mainly giving more than receiving. 
So you should be praying, ministering, giving the real word, and maybe even, you know, <laughs> laying some money down to help a widow. But it's kind of funny how in churches today, the widows, the poor widows are actually <laughs> giving their money to the pastor, which I don't think Jesus would agree with that. Um, I, I don't think Jesus would take money from a widow, to be quite honest. I don't think he would allow a widow to put, <laughs> well, he, you know, he allowed the one woman to put her might in, in, but I don't think he would have ever asked her to. That's just my, my reading of Jesus. Um, um, so anyway, um, that John 10, 12 is actually talking about people who call themselves pastors, but really they're in it for the money. And those are the ones who have come in the gate into the sheepfold the wrong, through the wrong way. They've jumped over the, uh, over the fence. They've forced their way into the ministry because it's what they wanted to do, not because God called them. But the good shepherd, Jesus, he is the door, <laughs> okay? And, um, and the sheep know his voice and they, 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 they hear his voice and they know it and they follow him. And that's why a lot of people, even though they go to church and, the, and they may have a hireling pastor who, who isn't leading them to the Lord, but they can still hear the voice of the Lord and they're still following the Lord in spite of what the hireling is doing and saying. Anyway, this applies to men and women if they're in the church in any kind of leadership. Um, they should have a calling and not be in it for the money. Well, anyway, moving on. Let's just look at history and you'll see that most women, in, in my opinion, most women preachers and teachers in history have not been, have not had a calling. Um, so here's one, Catherine Coleman. She's really famous for her healing ministry. Um, and a lot of people really admire and adore her, but you'll notice by the picture and um, she always wore a costume and that's what this is. It's a costume. It, she always had these flamboyant dresses that kind of made her look like an angel. You know, they're kind of evoking imagery of an angel. She, she always wore these um, specially tailored dresses um, and you can see the high heels there. And um, it's all, it glorifies the body. It draws a lot of attention to her. And it makes her look very special and very unique. And her, um, her ministry was very much a show. Um, just saying, that's what I see in it. Because I've seen lots of clips. She didn't really focus on preaching repentance. She herself had an affair early in her ministry and never... Um, repented of it or apologized for it. Um, she never admitted to any kind of sin. Um, and so she wasn't really into repentance, which is a hallmark of the gospel. But she was very much into um, seeking attention for herself, as you can even see by these images. You don't even have to hear her talk. Just look at the images and you can see that she's trying to get attention. Um, drawing drawing attention to herself, and um, she fo her 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 preaching focused a lot on the Holy Spirit, power, and healing. Those were basically all she talked about for the most part was Holy Spirit, power, and healing. She didn't talk a lot about Jesus, who is the gospel. He is the Word, and she didn't really share the gospel. So I, I think that her ministry was mainly a show. Uh, and it's okay if you disagree with me, but that's what I see. Amy Semple from McPherson, she's the one who founded the modern four square churches. Um, they started out with her and um, she was a great showman, even more than Kath Catherine Coleman. And she also drew a lot of attention to herself, especially her body. <laughs> she also wore costumes. And, um, and some of her costumes were, they glorified her body a lot. Like you can see in this picture, this is just one example of how she really tried to look like a beauty queen. Um, she, she had makeup, makeup and hairstyles that were like a movie starlet. 
and she showed off her figure as much as she could. Um, I shouldn't say as much as she could, but she did show it off. So anyway, more attention seeking, more showmanship. She also um, was rumored to have relationships with men that weren't right. And um, she staged her own disappearance and nobody knows why to this day. <laughs> so um, she definitely had some questionable um, morals and activities. Um, and she made some money doing, the, doing what she did. And if you watch her um, stuff, you know, her sermons, it was very much like walk, walk, going for entertainment, like watching a play or anything that's entertaining. It was like being at the theater or something. So, yeah, another showman, showwoman. <laughs> this one is, um, she's another famous one. Um, Mother Crawford, I forgot her first name, but... Um, but she actually founded the apostolic churches on the west coast and i used to attend one of those churches and it was a really nice church with a lot of nice people but there was a very heavy religious spirit in the church um they they thought that women can preach but they thought that women have to always wear a dress, never wear makeup, um, um, and different weird things like that. And they also had some really, um, really regimental beliefs about speaking in tongues and um, some other stuff that they were really regimental about, like you have to believe it exactly the way we teach it in no other way, <laughs> or else there's something wrong with you. And you may, you know, it's almost like you, you could be apostate if you don't agree with every single thing that they believe about tongues and, and other stuff. So it's got, it has a religious, um, thing to it. Of all these ladies from the past, I think Mother Crawford was the most sincere because she practiced what she preached. And she really did live a sacrifice, sacrificial life for the Lord. But some of her activities are questionable as well. Not exactly in the area of sin, but she did some stuff that is a little bit questionable. Um, and um, and I think it was because of a religious spirit. I don't think it was because she was trying trying to sin. Um, she wasn't apostate. She was just really, really regimental and religious. And so, and I, that's what I experienced when I went to an apostolic church. And that's why I had to leave it. The Holy Spirit told me you need to go because you can't grow here. And so, anyway, those are some people from the past. Now, some modern modern day people. Here's Beth Moore. Um, she's not as popular as she used to be, but she's she's made now the internet claims she's only made 15 million, but I don't buy that because one of her books alone, <laughs> you know, if you may, if you if you're a bestseller, that means you've sold a million copies of your book. It isn't likely if you're a big name author that you would only get one dollar for every book sold. You'd probably get more than a dollar for every book sold. But even if we pretend that Beth Moore only gets one dollar for every book sold, just by selling one of her famous books, she would have made at least a million dollars. And she's had multiple books that have sold a million, more than likely. Plus, she's on the talking circuit. And, a, and a, even a Christian speaker can easily earn, you know, 500000 for a weekend conference. And she does conferences all the time. So there's no way. I, I find it very hard to believe that she's only worth $15 million, But I think that's what I found on the Internet. But with all these modern day women preachers, I think it's false what they're saying that they've earned. I think they're trying to hide their earnings. Um, now, Beth Moore preaches, she doesn't preach the true gospel. Her gospel is that women need to be feminine and they can never criticize leaders and they have to do what they're told. 
<laughs> and that's her gospel. I've because I've been dragged into her teachings two or three times because in the early two thousands, every church had a Beth Moore thing for women and any type of woman activity that that you were involved in, it always would include Beth Moore. And you and you couldn't go to church without getting Beth Moore shoved down your throat. And I've never been a fan of Beth Moore, but I have had her shoved down my throat two or three times when I was in, involved in women's groups or women's ministries. And her, her message was always the same. You need to fall in line and do what you're told. And, and that's her gospel. So it's not really the true gospel. Here's two others that have followed in her footsteps. They're, they're more modern. Um, Priscilla Sh Shire and Lisa Turkers. And um, they basically are kind of the same thing. They're kind of like um, they give advice and pep talks to women. And they claim that they're preaching the gospel. Gospel, But I saw Lisa Turkers again. I got, I got roped into going to a women's conference recently. And um, I was so disgusted. Lisa Turkers was there. And she was actually saying that Jesus just had to get away and have some me time. And that's why he went to the mountain. No way. When Jesus went to the mountain to pray by himself, I mean, he was up all night fasting and praying. He wasn't, you know, in the hot tub with a glass of wine, which is what she was almost literally saying about Jesus, that he, he just needed to get away and rest. He wasn't resting on the mountaintop all night long. <laughs> he wasn't doing that. But she was suggesting that we have a glass of wine, you know, if we're if we've had a tough day. And it's like, that's not the gospel. I don't need a glass of wine. I need Jesus, you know. Anyway, um, so the Internet claims that Lisa Turkhurst is only worth less than a million, 800,000. But again, just one best selling book is worth if she only makes one dollar off of each book, it's worth a million dollars. So I don't find that believable. Plus she's on the talk, the um, talking circuit. So I really find it hard to believe that she's worth less than a million. Priscilla Shire, the internet, want, some websites say she's only worth 3 million. Other websites, there's one website that says she was worth 24, but I, I find that hard to believe too, because she's an actress. And even if you're a Christian actress, if you're in a best you know, a, a hit movie like War Room, you probably made three million just acting the part in War Room because that's typical, you know, because for a secular Hollywood person, they could easily make 54 million on one film, you know? So for the internet to say that Priscilla Shire is only worth three million to me doesn't make sense. That sounds more like what she earned just by being in the War Room. And then she's got all these book, um, all these books that are constantly coming out and she's on the talking circuit. So I don't see how she could only be worth three million. Here's another one. Here's another two. Now these two um, actually teach um, apostasy. Um, Paula White and her husband told people, <laughs> told married couples that they should watch porn. Um, and that's just one example. And both her and Joyce Meyer teach people that Jesus is basically like the brother of Satan and he went to hell and got punished by the demons and that he was the first born again person and all this total heresy, complete heresy that they teach. Um, as you can see, Paula Whitelock likes to draw attention to her body, which you can see in that picture. And that's very typical of her. Joyce Meyer loves jewelry and everything expensive. Now the internet said that Joyce Meyer was worth $9 million. And again, I don't believe it because her home alone is worth $10 million. And she, she also owns multiple homes for family members, plus a, a $10 million jet, plus her husband has a, a Mercedes something that's, I don't know, a worth a lot of money. Um, so there's no way that she's only worth $9 million because her home alone, without any furnishings, is worth more than that. And she has way more property than just that. And um, her business office, it's like this ma massive complex, um, has some furniture in it that's worth like, you know, $28,000 and stuff like that just for one piece of furniture. 
So there's no way that she's only worth $9 million. Um, Paula White, same thing. I think it said they said that she was worth $5 million. And again, that would only be five best-selling best books, and she has more than five best-selling books. So um, I think that these people are deliberately hiding their wealth because they don't want Christians to realize how much they're getting taken advantage of. Um, so I think they're they're colluding with people in the internet to hide the truth, which is that they're fleecing the, the flock. Um, and so there's there's duplicity here, there's dishonesty, there's body image focus, um, and there's false gospel mixed in this. Probably the best one out of all of them is this lady because she was sincere in what she believed and she did practice what she preached. Um, and having a religious spirit, I would say, is the least <laughs> of the sins of all these others that I've shown you. But um, but anyway, so she's a much better example. But but so so we know there's lots of bad examples of women being leaders, preachers, and teachers. Obviously, now of course there's lots of bad examples with men as well. Most male preachers, teachers, and leaders are no good either. Um, but, but still, we want to know what does the Bible actually say? What are women allowed to do and not allowed to do? So I'm just going to go over it a little bit. Um, so as far as there is an example in the Bible of co-leadership, and that is with Priscilla and Aquila. They, if you look up all the verses, I, I'm just showing a couple of verses here, but there's there's a few, several more. And in basically all the verses, they're almost mentioned like their names are side by side as if they're the same person almost. They're clearly a husband and wife, but Paul Paul repeatedly gives them equal credence in every mention of them. Repeatedly and consistently gives them equal credence. Um, he, he talks about both of them as being leaders. Um, and, and they took Apollo aside and together taught Apollo. Um, so this is pretty obvious that they were co-leading the church. They were co-teaching, -co co-preaching. I don't know what, else, what all they did. Um, and there's a verse where Paul even calls them his co-workers in the, in the faith or in the ministry or something. So they were kind of on an equal level. But notice Priscilla didn't boss Aquila around. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But um, and she didn't boss Apollo around either. She simply taught Apollo better so that he could go out there and be a better preacher. But she didn't do it alone. She did it. She and Aquila taught Paul Apollo together as a team. Um, it wasn't Priscilla doing it, taking Apollo aside. Anyhow, um, but can women be pastors and leaders? Well, this is a little bit debatable, and again, I'm using Young's literal translation because it's it's a better translation than King James. Um, and so Paul says, I commend Phoebe, our sister, being a ministrant of the assembly. So he's calling her a minister of the assembly. Some people interpret that as her being a pastor, and others don't. Um I'm not 100% sure, but if you read the, le the rest of the verse, it says that she had leadership over Paul. For she also became a leader of many and of myself. So that is the part that makes me think that, yes, she was some sort of pastor or leader over men. Now, her husband is not mentioned here, and I'm assuming she didn't have one. I'm assuming that she was um, single and she was a leader. But notice that these instances in the Bible are kind of rare. They're not, um, you, don't, you don't read about a lot of women. Um, in the New Testament, the only two women that we read of who showed leadership um, acts are Priscilla along with her husband and Phoebe here. And Phoebe, Paul fell under Phoebe's leadership. He put himself under her leadership. And we know that Paul traveled from church to church and didn't have his own place where he stayed. So that's, he was more like an advan, what we today would call an evangelist 
who travels the circuit. He was he was an apostle because he actually established churches, but then he would go and establish more and then come back and revisit or write a letter to a church he had been he had established to make sure that they're still healthy. You know, he would keep checking on him. He wouldn't leave them high and dry. He wanted to make sure they were still healthy. But he let other people in in that community take over the the day to day leadership. So it could have been Phoebe was a leader of one of these places he had been to, and um, when he visited again, he fell under her leadership because you know um, he didn't want to um, mess up what she was doing. I guess. So, so there's an example of a woman who's clearly a leader. Whether you call her a pastor or not, it sounds like she is a pastor to me. And then again, he's calling Priscilla and Aquila his fellow workmen. In fact, he lists Priscilla's name first. But in other verses, he lists Aquila's name first. I don't think it mattered to Paul. To Paul, they were, as far as the spirit went, they were equals, total equals. Um, and he fell under the leadership of Phoebe. But again, this is just two women. This isn't like tons and tons and tons of women. It's just two women. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later, too, the fact that it, there aren't many examples, just a, just a couple. Um, so an example that's kind of similar to Priscilla and, Kil and Aquila is Val Wolf and her husband. Now, you might say I'm being disrespectful because I didn't say her husband's name. But in reality, their ministry just goes by her name. It doesn't go by, it's not both of their names. It's just her name. Um, she is the key leader in the ministry, but um, he, she never tells him what to do. She doesn't assign him duties. She is not his boss. He decides on his own what he wants to do. And he's established himself as um, kind of like a logistics guy behind the scenes. He does all the logistics of the ministry. And he also has leadership over the other people helping her out. Um, and he does it because that's his choice and that's what he wants to do. That's his gifting. And she does almost all of the preaching, teaching, and praying for people. But he assists on the side. And sometimes he, he teaches and does little lessons. But for the most part, he prefers not to. So again... It's almost like Priscilla and Aquila, except that she's in the forefront, but she doesn't boss him around. She doesn't assign him duties. He's totally his own person. And um, he, he, he's highly involved in the ministry. Without him, I don't know if she'd have a ministry, but, but it's in her name because she's the, the front person. Um, and she's the one who really has the gifting for preaching. So um, that's one modern example. Now, this woman, the reason I bring her up is she's the only modern woman or, or dead woman who I would listen to on YouTube personally. I, I, um, I trust her as being a woman of God because she always preaches repentance, holiness, um, this living, living for Jesus, the sacrificial life. She doesn't draw attention to her body or herself. Um, she's not an attention seeker at all. She's not um, big, you know, trying to hoodwink people into giving her tons of money. Um, she doesn't seem to live a rich lifestyle at all. Um, she's a real hands-on person um, and a real practical person, and she seems to be very genuine and honest, and I don't disagree with the gospel she preaches on minor points a little bit because she focuses a lot on healing and I don't agree 100% with everything she says about healing, but she still teaches the gospel. Her focus is Jesus Christ and um, she always preaches repentance and holiness and all of that stuff. So um, she's the only woman pastor I've ever known of who I would actually listen to. I don't, I don't know of any others. But there's very few men pastors who I would listen to, but I would probably listen to five or so of them. Um, more, more men than women, for sure. Um, and I think it's really important that you understand that Val Wolf never leads her husband. <laughs> she does not lead her husband. Now, she leads, she leads other people in the sense of being a pastor, but she doesn't lead her husband. We'll come back to that. Actually, maybe we'll be coming to that here.
Okay. Now here, here's Deborah. Um, Deborah was the only judge. And here again, we go back to that point of it's very rare for women to be in leadership in the Bible. She was a judge of Israel, but she was the only female judge of Israel. All those other judges were men. And there is no queen of Israel ever, nor will there ever be. All the kings of Israel were kings, not queens. Um, the idea of a queen, you know, um, it isn't really um, a God-inspired idea. Um, so, again, we see Deborah here who, who became a judge of Israel. It said that she was married and lived with her husband and all that. She never bossed him around. There's no, no verses showing that she told her husband what to do. And here's a great thing here. This is kind of neat. In this passage, a man is asking her to lead the way in battle because he's a coward. And he goes, well, since you prophesied, will you go with me? <laughs> he's a coward. And she goes, okay, I'll go with you. But because you have asked me to go with you, because you want to hide behind my skirt, basically is what she's saying, the skirts of a woman, therefore, you will not be the one who kills Sisera. A woman will kill Sisera. Um, the Lord will, will bring Sisera into a woman's hand, not yours, because you have chosen to hide behind the skirts of a woman when you go up. When you go up. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, she... Uh, he followed Deborah because he was too afraid to go by himself. But the battle was won, but he didn't get to kill Sisera, the man Sisera. A woman killed that man. Um, and that was to his dishonor. So here we have an example of somebody who had a calling from God, a female who had a calling from God to judge Israel, but not to be queen and not to lead men. So it, she knew her boundaries. She knew what her calling was and what it wasn't. Just like this woman here. She knows her boundaries. She knows that she is a, is, has a calling to preach, teach, and minister. But she doesn't have a calling to drag her husband around by the nose ring. This woman knew that she had a calling to prophesy and judge over Israel. In, in other words, to decide things, a judge is somebody who decides righteously. But she didn't have a calling to lead men, and she didn't want to do it. So interesting, isn't it? Then we, we see the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, she, this, this describes the fact that she is a businesswoman and a pillar in the community. And she makes her own independent decisions with the money that she has earned. She decides, she hires the staff for the household. She rules over them, which are mainly going to be, be females, you know, maidens that she's ruling over. But she does have leadership. And she goes out in public and sells her, her, her own personal merchandise that she has created. And she buys land. Does she ask her husband permission? Nope. She doesn't need her husband's permission. God has given her the talent, the skills, the calling to do these things. Her husband has a different talent, skills, and calling. that He's doing his own work. She's doing her own work. And it's good. It's all good. So she's a businesswoman. Um, everybody knows her. Um, she takes care of strangers, those who work for her, and her family. And that's why she does what she does. And that's the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, she she makes decisions. She she buys land, considers land and buys it. You know, a lot of people think that women aren't allowed to make any decisions um, and stuff like that, which is totally ridiculous because the Proverbs 31 one woman is a big decision maker. OK, <laughs> so um, in Acts 16, we see Lydia, who was also a businesswoman well known in her community. You can't be a businesswoman or any kind of business owner without being having some sort of leadership skill and calling. You just can't do it. You have to be you, you have to be willing and dealing, buying and trading, hiring and firing. You have to be doing things like that in order for promoting, marketing, 
I mean, Lydia did some stuff that, that some people think that women aren't allowed to do. Some people think women have to stay home all day, and that just isn't true. Lydia was out there, and so was the Proverbs 31 woman. So yes, women can be leaders. Um, and remember, don't shoot the messenger. Now, just because Deborah, just because it wasn't part of God's normal plan for a woman to be a, um, a judge over Israel, we know it wasn't his regular plan because it only happened once, right? <laughs> but just because it's not God's regular plan doesn't mean that you should shoot the messenger, okay? The donkey only talked once to Balaam. But does that mean that the donkey was evil, sent by the devil, and no one should listen to what the donkey said? No. Donkeys don't usually talk. But that doesn't mean that when one does, it's of the devil. <laughs> and babies don't usually praise the Lord. But that doesn't mean that it's of the devil if they do. And there's another verse that says the rocks will cry out. And another verse says the trees will clap their hands. So even nature is going to is going to minister to the Lord when called. So anybody who's called, whether you're a turtle, <laughs> a donkey, or even a woman, <laughs> if you're called, answer the calling. Deborah was called, but she didn't step beyond what she was called to do, like some of these modern women today are doing. And she didn't have a false calling where she asserted herself to be judged when God didn't want her to be judged like some of these women today. Um, so yeah, it's rare for a woman to be leading men. It's rare for a woman. It's, it's more rare for a woman to be a pastor or, or um, that type of thing, a teacher. But if you have a calling, you have a calling. It's for some reason. In my opinion, the, the reason women sometimes have a calling is because men aren't willing to answer the call. It's because some man didn't answer. And God says, okay, I'm going to pick a woman. I'm going to pick a donkey. I'm going to pick a baby. If, if, if no man answers the call that I've put out, then I'm going to give it to somebody lower down the line. But, that, but he'll still work his will. So um, <laughs> I just like to think of myself as a donkey because I teach all the time. Um, but I don't think there's enough men out there doing it. You know, honestly, if there were enough men out there teaching and preaching the word of God, I wouldn't be on YouTube. I really don't think so. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Um, so what's the difference between Jezebel and a godly woman? Well, let's nitpick it. Okay, and again, I'm using Young's literal translation because it's accurate. And the key, if you go to the King James and read First Timothy two twelve, it's not accurate. Although I love King James. Um, so let's look at First Timothy two twelve. Now in King James, it makes you it, it sounds like women cannot teach any men whatsoever, and that isn't what it said. In Young's literal translation, it specifically says a woman cannot teach or rule over her husband her husband now this is where val wolf comes in she can teach the population in general but she and she can have leadership in her church but she's not allowed to lead her husband or teach her husband see she understands the boundary and that's the boundary you see here um, she cannot teach or rule over her own husband. And then the word own is used multiple times in other verses that refer to women. Um, Revelation 2.20. Now here's Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, but she isn't. However, there are real prophetesses because, you know, there's real prophetesses in the Bible. Deborah was one of them. And then there was... Um, a person, a man, I, I think it was, I can't remember the man's name, but he had two daughters that were prophetesses in the New Testament. And I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And then there was Anna, the prophetess who held baby Jesus in her arms in the temple. So there are prophetesses. That's a, a legitimate calling and gift. 
you know, of God. But Jezebel is not a prophetess, yet she claims she's a prophetess. And she teaches people. Now, teaching isn't her sin, okay? But what is a sin is that she teaches them to commit whoredom. In other words, she's teaching apostasy. That's where these two women come in. It isn't a sin for them to teach. The reason they're they're sinning is because they're both teaching apostasy. Okay? Now, Jezebel told her husband what to do, and she expected him to do it. And he did. <laughs> That's why her name is Jezebel, right? So... Again, women are allowed to have opinions. We are allowed to share our wisdom. Let's go back to the Proverbs 31 woman. Her mouth hath opened in wisdom. So not only does she have wisdom, but she's speaking it. And the law of kindness is on her tongue. This means she is sharing her advice and wisdom with others. Yes, she is. She's speaking. She's not silent. But that's a different, big difference between sharing your wisdom with your husband and literally telling your husband what to do, which is what Jezebel does with Ahab. She literally tells him what to do. She commands him, and he listens and follows. So that, that was the problem with Jezebel and Ahab. Um, I'm sure Priscilla shared her opinions and her advice with Akila all the time. But she didn't rule over Achilla. See, there's a big difference. And Achilla didn't have to listen to her if he didn't want to. You know, because and Ahab didn't have to listen to Jezebel, but Ahab chose to listen to Jezebel. <laughs> you know? Um, now, there's an example in the Old Testament of um, Abigail who married King David. She became one of his wives. Her husband was Nabal the fool. And she didn't even bother talking to Nabal before she went and saved his life um, because she knew he was, wasn't going to listen to her. But in their case, it probably would have been good if he had listened to her because he was the fool and she was the wise one. But she never, um, but, so a man can make a choice to listen to his wife if it's a godly choice. You know, I, if, and if, it's, if he, she's giving him godly wisdom and he listens to her, that's okay. Because he's really following Jesus, you know. He's not following her, but because her, her advice is godly, he wants to do it because he knows it will, it will get him closer to the Lord. So it's not a sin for a man to listen to his wife, but he shouldn't be listening to his wife because that's what she wants. He should be listening to his wife because he hears the words of Jesus Christ coming out of her mouth. Okay, so if Nabal had been willing to listen to Abigail, she probably would have given him words of wisdom, but she already knew probably by experience that he didn't listen to her. So she just went out and saved his life behind his back. And then he ended up dying later and she ended up becoming a wife of King David. So she was honored for what she did. And again, Abigail... Um, went independently and made her own decision that she and did something that she knew her husband would not like. She did it behind his back, but she was right. She did what was righteous and just. She gave food to the starving soldiers of King David when they had helped her. Uh, they had helped the servants who worked on her property, and she knew they were hungry and they needed food really bad. And she went out and fed him, even though she knew her husband wouldn't like it. But she was doing what was righteous. So again, women, obeying your husbands doesn't mean to the point of sin. If your husband wants you to do something that's sinful, then you should not obey. <laughs> and a lot of husbands leave, leave, leave their wives into sin. And vice versa. So anyway, common sense, basically. And if you want to understand women's roles in the church better, then I ask you not to use the King James Bible as a reference book. Use Young's literal translation or some other or, or a Greek, a Greek translation. Um, go straight to the Greek. Um, and then you'll have a better idea of what Paul was saying about women, what the New Testament is saying about women. But overall, I would say 
that it's, it's God's regular plan is that men are in leadership. But there are rare examples where a woman is called because the men aren't answering. That's my personal opinion. That's the way I see it. Um, and that's all I wanted to share with, share with you. Anyway, God bless you.